starting our uh, second week in uh, Jesus Dabblers. And uh, so, um, so we're going to start off with, um, I started off with a definition of the word dabble last week on what dabble means. Okay, so dabble means to work or involve oneself superficially or intermittently without making a firm commitment. That's dabble. That's what it means to dabble in something, right? And I, I showed you, I, had, I kind of shared with you a little bit of the stuff that I've dabbled in, right, over the years. I talked about kite jumping last week, right? And um, I was actually showing them some videos of what kite jumping is. Like people, yeah, they do actually kite jump. I didn't make that up, but you can kite jump. Stupid, but you can do that. Um, uh, the other thing that I've been dabbling in, I'll show you this stuff, is I have a CNC in my basement. So I've been dabbling with making like some 3D. I'm actually trying to make a nativity set. And my time's running out. It's going to be like I'm getting close here. So, uh, so this is uh, some things that I've been making. I'll show this real quick up here. You probably can't see it. Can you see that? Oh, there it is. He's so cute. Um, so, uh, you know, so it's 3D and it kind of turns like this and it carves it and all that stuff. And so I'm trying to get used to that. I have a really fat shepherd that I did. He looks like um, he ate way too many rice cakes or honey cakes or something. Kind of, you know, but it's okay. It's going to look pretty eclectic by the time it's done. It's going to be funny, you know. And then another thing I did, I, I worked, um, I took a photograph and so I'm trying to figure out actually how to make a 3D relief from a photograph using the CNC. All right? So kind of experimenting with that. But I, I'm just, I'm, I'm dabbling in it, right? That's what I'm dabbling in. And so this whole idea of Jesus dabbling um, is more serious than what I'm talking about dabbling in these kind of things, right? In fact, um, I always like to talk about like the one thing like the one thing I want you to get tonight above anything else tonight. Um, listen, listen, listen to what I found. Like when I'm getting ready for this or whatever, I, I read a lot of stuff, okay? Lots of commentaries, lots of people who have comments. I mean, I, I look at a lot of stuff. I want you to listen to what this uh, one commentator said about the dangerousness of dabbling. Okay, listen to what this says. Um, he, just, he gives this example. What are your personal goals? A corporate interviewer asked the young man hoping for his first job. Oh, I would like to dabble in sales, right? And then he says, what are your long-range interests in medicine? An interviewer asked a young woman interviewing for medical school. Oh, I would like to dabble in brain surgery. Okay. Um, dabblers are casual hobbyists, right? Um, stockholders don't want dabblers handling their money. Um, patients with a brain tumor, they don't want their brain surgeon dabbling in brain surgery, right? Um, spiritual dabblers, they're hobbyists too. And some things are way too important and dangerous to dabble in. And especially when it comes to spiritual things. Because it has eternal consequences. So being a dabbler can have some very, very serious consequences. So here's the one thing that I want you to get tonight, above anything else that we talk about. It's this. Jesus dabblers want certainty and a return of their investment. As opposed to Jesus, who wants unreserved sacrifice. Jesus dabblers want certainty and a return in their investment versus Jesus, who wants unreserved sacrifice. So, um, so I was thinking about where, where I wanted to take us tonight in Scripture. And um, so Jesus' disciples, we're, we're going to actually end up, uh, if you want to go there, you can, in Luke chapter 9. That's where we're going to end up. If you need a Bible, raise your hand, because we got Bibles. And we can get you a Bible if you need one. So um, here comes Robin. Robin's the one that throws the Bibles at people. So um, 
All right, so I'm going to kind of set this up, all right? We're going to go to, to Luke chapter 9. We're going to start around verse 51. Okay, so Jesus' disciples and his would-be disciples, okay, um, came to him with certain expectations, Okay, so I, I, I don't want you to think, like sometimes, like when you go to church all the time and you hear pastors preach about this and you hear about the disciples, sometimes we forget they were human beings, like you and me. They had expectations. Okay, so don't fool yourself to think that the disciples did not have any expectations, but their expectations were so different than Jesus's expectations. Um, and I don't know if you've ever been like that's happened to you before. Like you've expected something to take place and it was so different, right? Okay, so, so when, I was, when I was nine years old, okay, I had to go to the dentist, okay? This was 50 years ago, okay? A little bit over 50 years ago, okay? And so I had to go to the dentist. I was going to have four teeth pulled, okay? Four teeth pulled. Okay, so I, and I didn't know at the time that I was having my wisdom teeth pulled, okay? So I had some different expectations, okay? So now again, I remember 50 years ago, okay? So I'm in the chair, the dentist comes up, okay? So the dentist, you know, he does the little thing about the mosquito, like here comes the mosquito with the little shot, <laughs> You know, yeah, right in there or whatever. So he shoots me with Novocaine, right? And so I'm sitting in the chair. So he's got an expectation that it's going to numb my mouth enough for him to yank my teeth. Now, these are wisdom teeth, okay? So I'm there in the chair. He comes back, and he, you know, is poking around. Can you feel that? Can you feel that? I'm like, oh, I can feel it a little bit. He goes, oh, we're going to have to bring out the mosquito again. So he brings out the mosquito, and he shoots me again, <laughs> right? And he leaves, okay? So his expectation is that's going to work. That's great. So he comes back the next time. This time he doesn't even test. He just starts yanking, okay? So he's like gets his thing. I don't know, you know, you know, gets his pliers. I don't know what they're called. But anyway, he gets his thing out, and he starts pulling. And I'm like, it is hurting. I'm like, I'm hurting. I'm like... And my dad could hear me scream in the waiting room. Okay? So he's yanking. I'm like, I feel that. That hurts. Right? And it's at that point, the dentist, no lie. You know the little mirror that they look at your teeth with or whatever? He throws it against the wall because he is ticked off at me. So he gets the mosquito, but this time, I think it was more like a hornet. Because he shot me so full of that stuff, right? And he proceeds to yank out my, my wisdom teeth, right? But, but see, I had an expectation, because I had been to the dentist before, and I thought, it's fine. You know, I've been to the dentist. No big deal. I had that expectation. He had an expectation, and we were both wrong, right? Oh, yeah, by the way, okay, just truth-telling here. I didn't go to the dentist after that for 17 years. Because after that took place, there was no way in hell I was going back to the dentist, right? No way, right? But I'm good now. I don't mind going to the dentist now. I'm, I'm, in fact, I like having my teeth cleaned. I know that's weird. But, you know, when they're, I'm like, just get it off. I don't care. Just get it off. You know, I'm good with that. But anyway, so, but those were my expectations, okay? I had certain expectations. Okay, so. So here's the thing. Um, Jesus' disciples and would-be disciples, they had some expectations of Jesus. Um, in fact, Jews back then, when they were thinking about the Messiah, they had a few expectations on what Jesus was going to provide. They, they thought that he was going to reestablish the kingdom of God on earth, like that was going to take place. You know, they thought that... Um, he was going to free them from being held hostage by the Romans. That was an expectation they had. Um, he, they thought that he was going to restore God's law on the way it used to be. They thought that he was going to 
um, uphold godly justice. So he was going to bring total justice to what was going on. And they also thought he was going to usher in an economic boom. Like there was going to be some good things that were happening. Okay, so you need, to, you need to think about that as a Jewish person back then. When they think about the Messiah, they're thinking like when the Messiah comes, this is going to be good. Right, it's going to be good. But it was all for their sakes. It was all for their sakes. Okay, so in other words, they were willing to follow Jesus into battle expecting a good return for their investment. Okay. So let me just ask you a question. Like when you came to Jesus, what was your expectation? Because I know that we hear all kinds of things. Like, especially in our Christian culture, and I don't care who you're watching on TV, and the kind of expectations that they promote will happen to you if you come to Jesus. And so I don't know what kind of expectations you had, but I'm sure there were some. Um, when I was growing up, I... I got this catalog when I was growing up. Let's, let's go to the next one up here. I don't know if any of you, when you were growing up, you ever got a Johnson Smith catalog. Did anybody ever get a Johnson Smith catalog growing up? No, but I'm that old. Wow. I, okay. The Johnson Smith catalog, I got that every single month. Like, and you could buy all of this junk. And I loved it. As an eight or nine-year-old, I could get stuff. Like, I actually found a page from that. And, um... Like, one of the coolest things that a little boy would want to get are, were x-ray vision glasses for a dollar, right? And, I mean, okay, listen to this. It says, greatest illusion of the century. Apparently, see bones through skin, see through clothes, amaze and embarrass everyone. <laughs> so I was like, that was only a dollar. So I sent for that. And I got them, and they didn't work, right? I mean, I ordered almost every single thing on this sheet. I ordered this thing, right? Right? And there was this one thing that I ordered. It was like this little monster thing that you could order, and then like how they described it. Like, he's like your virtual pet, like how they described this thing. And it cost me like $8.50, okay? $8.50 for an eight- or nine-year-old. Uh, 40 some years ago that was a lot of stinking money right so I saved it up I sent it off I had this expectation I can't wait till it gets here I dreamt about having this awesome relationship with this monster <laughs> okay I mean it just you know crazy stuff right and it you know, a week goes by three weeks goes by two months go by I'm still waiting for the monster to get here, man, right? Ah, expectations, right? They're crazy. So if we're honest, if we're honest, when we put our faith in Jesus, we have, we expect something in return. Like when we come to Jesus, we're expecting something in return, but I wonder if our expectations are not in line with what Jesus says, right? So we're going to look at this passage in Luke, and it, it actually starts with the, uh, a really strange situation with the disciples um, and the expectations and how out of whack they were with Jesus, all right? So we're going to start in Luke chapter 9, starting in verse 51. Okay, listen to what this says. It says, As the time drew near for him to ascend to heaven, Jesus resolutely sent out for um, Jerusalem. He sent messengers ahead to a Samaritan village to prepare for his arrival. Okay, so, so we, we've talked before about how the Jews, um, how, what they thought about Samaritans. They were considered half-breeds. They were Hebrews that had married Gentiles, right? And so just even because of that, they were like, you guys are second-class citizens. No, probably 
fourth class citizens, right? We don't want anything to do with you. So even going through Samaria in a Samaritan village was not a normal thing that Jews would do. All right, so he's going through this village, okay? Then in verse 53, it says, But the people of the village did not welcome Jesus because he was on his way to Jerusalem. Stop, right there. So what's the big deal? So so they were going to Jerusalem. Well, the Samaritans absolutely resented the Jewish temple. They resented it. Because they weren't, for one thing, they weren't allowed in the Jewish temple. Because they weren't allowed in the Jewish temple, they made their own temple to worship God. 200 years earlier than this, the Jews came and destroyed their temple. Okay? So they had every right to be a little ticked off at them. Okay? So that's why they were so upset. All right? And then verse 54 says, When James and John saw this, they said to Jesus, I love this. Okay, remember, these are just normal guys. Okay, truck drivers. Okay, listen. This is what they said. When James and John saw this, they said, Jesus, Lord, should we call down fire from heaven to burn them up? Okay? And then listen to Jesus' response. But Jesus turned and rebuked them. You don't know what your hearts are like. Your expectations are way off on what you expect from me. For the Son of Man has not come to destroy people's lives, but to save them. That's why Jesus came. Oh, by the way, did you know that? That's why he came. He didn't come here to make your life miserable and to make you feel less than that's not why he came he makes it very clear the reason why he came was he wanted to um, save you save you from yourself save you from experiencing hell and an eternity without him so, and then it says, so they went on to another village. Okay, so, all right, so let's talk about this for a second. So their expectations of Jesus, um, they were way out of whack. Just like ours can be way out of whack. With what we think and we expect from Jesus. And right after this takes place, Jesus explains three qualities of a Christ follower and compares them to some Jesus dabblers. Okay, so for the next three weeks, we're going to look at these. Um, and he knew, he knew the disciples had gotten it wrong. He knew that, and um, they had the wrong idea on what it cost you to follow Jesus. And I think we do too. I mean, I, I am so concerned about our Christian culture in this country. Because like I said last week, I think we're calling people to a lifestyle and we're not calling them to Jesus. And there's a problem with that. All right? So tonight we're going to look at a dabbler. Okay, tonight we're going to look at one of these dabblers um, that wants a guarantee of security and a return of investment. All right, so let's go to verse 57. Okay, listen to what this says. As they were walking along, someone said to Jesus, Hey, Jesus, I will follow you wherever you go. I'm there. Dude, you can count on me. I'll follow you wherever you go. Listen to Jesus' reply. But Jesus replied, foxes have dens to live in and birds have nests, but the Son of Man has no place even to lay his head. What a weird reply to this guy who basically said, I'll follow you, Jesus. And then Jesus basically replies in a way that seems a little, this is a little harsh, Jesus. What are you talking about? I mean, 
this guy had what I call this romantic idea of following Jesus. Do you know what I mean by that? Like, you have this flowery picture on what it's going to be like when you go to choose to follow Jesus. Like, everything's going to get better in your life. Like, you're going to, all of a sudden, you're going to have, all your bills will be paid. All of a sudden, you're going to have all of this, this, uh, these things happen in your life that are good and it alleviates all your pain and all of a sudden there's no more, you know, confusion or there's no more. I mean, you start thinking about all these romantic ideas, okay? And he had this picture of being connected to this famous teacher and it meant that he would get some perks because remember, the reason why Jesus replied, he knew what was going on in this guy's heart. Like, just like he knows what goes on in our heart, right? And he would get some perks and maybe even become rich and famous. Who knows? He was pretty famous, right? In fact, listen to what this one commentator says about this. He said, Jesus was saying to him, if you follow me, you have to forget all the ideas about living in a beautiful, comfortable home. Jesus had nothing on this earth that he could call his own possession except his seamless robe, and he sometimes requires his followers to have the same loose grip on the comforts of life as he did. So here we have this guy who says, I'll follow you, Jesus. And I'm, I'm just, you know what? And I'm expecting there's some things I'm going to expect. Some security. I'm going to have some awesome things. I'm going to have stuff. I'm going to have all of this stuff if I follow you. That's what he's thinking. And then Jesus goes, ah. No. There's no guarantee, right, of any of that. And so as I started thinking about this part right here, um, I started thinking about some contrasts of what Jesus was saying, Okay. Here's the first contrast. It's this. Jesus dabblers have a tight grip on their stuff. Christ followers have a loose grip on their stuff. In fact, they hold on to their stuff with open hands. They're not close-fisted. They hold their stuff with an open hand. Right? That's what a Christ follower is. That's the idea he's trying to get this guy to understand. If you're going to follow me, you need to understand. You need to have a loose grip. A loose grip on your stuff. Jesus dabblers are committed to security. Like they're fully committed to making sure that, you know what, i got to make sure that I never put myself in a situation that might be a little scary. I'm going to make sure that I make decisions so that I don't rock the boat too much. I'm, the, I'm just, they're fully committed to security in their life, right? That's a Jesus dabbler. Mm, a Jesus follower, they're committed to obedience. They're fully committed to obedience, no matter where it takes them. Security is second. Obedience is first. As a Christ follower. Jesus dabblers want guarantees. Jesus follower, uh, dabblers want guarantees. So Jesus, okay, look, look, look. I will follow you if... You fill in the blank. I'll follow you if Jesus' followers expect uncertainty. Jesus' followers expect uncertainty. You know the stuff that's going on in our country right now? How crazy it is, right? Insane what's going on in our country right now. How should a Christ follower respond? We should respond with prayer. We should be in God's word. 
Because see, you can have uncertainty all over the place, but you can also have clarity. And where you get clarity is what God says. And so a Jesus dabbler, you know, they're going to be committed. You know, they want this guarantee. And when uncertainty starts to take place, like if we've only been dabbling in Jesus or whatever, we are open game. I'm telling you, we are open game. So I have some questions for you to ask yourself this week, okay? Um, this isn't a very long message tonight because I want you to take a little bit of time. I've got two questions for you to wrestle with this week, okay? Here's the first one. What is it in my life that I have too tight of a grip of? What is it? What is it in my life that I have too tight of a grip of? My pride? An addiction? Toxic relationship? What is it in my life that I am holding on too tightly of? That's the first question. Second question is this. What kind of deals have I made with God? What kind of deals have I made with God? When we were getting ready to come down here to start this church and God was making it very clear that he wanted Kelly and I to start this church and to move into the neighborhood, I have a whole list of reasons why I told him it was not a good idea. And so I decided that I was going to make a deal with God. Not a good idea. And I'll never forget that as I was contemplating this and thinking about this, my deal was, God, I will only do this. I will only do this. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just a person. I will only do this if you make it easy. Did you ever make a deal like that? I like, I'll do this if it's easy. And I remember that I was driving down Erie Street, coming down here. And you ever, like, God, like, he just starts to get your attention. Like, I was driving down, and all of a sudden, it was like this thought came to my mind. And I couldn't get it out of my mind. And I started seeing people in their houses, people on the street, the guys sitting on porches, the kids running in the street, the, the, the way the houses were, all of those things. And God's Spirit asked me a question. And He said, Do you think it's easy for them? Do you think their life is easy? And I stopped. I had to pull over. Because at that moment, God was saying, you have 
some wrong expectations. And I was a pastor. And it was at that moment that God hit me. Well, and down here we say he punched me in the neck. Okay? He got my attention. And he said, look, look, look. I am calling you down here. Whether it's going to be easy or not, that is none of your business. What I want to know is, are you going to follow me? That's what I want to know. And that's what God is asking you tonight. Maybe you've been dabbling in Jesus. And you know what he's asking tonight? He's saying, look, look, look. Are you going to follow me? I understand the dabbling stuff. You're playing a dangerous game. And we might be going, I don't know. It Will it be easy? No. Will there be times when God is going to show up and absolutely amaze you? Yes. So what are you going to do? What are those deals you've made with God? So tonight, I want to give you an opportunity to work through that. All right? Randy, can you find the song Surrender on there? Okay? Those of you that are on Facebook, thank you for joining us tonight. Um, I want to invite you to uh, check in this week. We'll give you some more updates. On TNC2, we love our online church family. God bless you, and we'll continue to pray for you. What we're going to do is, we've got a song that we're going to sing together. I don't know where you've been with God. This is an opportunity for you to actually do some business. Maybe you've been dabbling. Maybe God's going, you know what? Mm, I need you to follow. I need you to follow. So while we sing this song, this is your opportunity to do some business. If you need to come up here and sit on stage and do some business with God, you feel free to do that. All right? I'm going to get out of the way, and we're going to sing this together, and then I'll close this when we're done. All right? Awesome.